Welcome to our pre-conference portion of the Great Awakening Conference here in Tampa Bay, Florida. I'm Michael O'Fallon, and it is my pleasure to welcome you to this important and historic conference. It's a pleasure to have you here with us in Tampa Bay physically, or if you are watching us live stream right now back at home. We live in strange times. We live in times where what we understand is reality of what we have always known, of what have been gradual changes throughout our history, have drastically changed. And maybe some of you are asking why. And this message is meant not only for those that I know that we're quite well recognized within churches because we have addressed many of these issues going back to 2017, back before anyone was speaking about things such as intersectionality or critical race theory, back when most folks that were properly evangelical and exegetically biblical, keeping to a historic hermeneutic and confessional, were confused by these terms. But yet for years, those terms, those ideas were used throughout what we know as evangelicalism. So you might want to ask yourself, what's going on? What is behind all of this mess? Because it's not just within the church. We understand that this is everywhere now. We understand that it's in education. We understand that it's in law enforcement. We understand that it's all across social media. And if you think that you're going to relax and sit down and watch a ball game, it's there too. We're living in one of the most perilous times in human history. The first century BC poet Virgil stated, blessed is he who understands the hidden causes of things. And if you understand the causes of things, you will not only understand but as well anticipate what will be happening around you in the coming months. Because in order to transform our culture, our economy, to transform our political structures, to transform our religions, our societies, against the realized democratic will of the people, you must go through several steps in transformation, a psychological transformation, a physical and philosophical transformation, a cultural and political transformation, and a spiritual transformation as well. And in fact, gaining an entirely new ecumenical metaphysic. It's hard to conceive all that's been taking place and changing around us as we recognize that the great tectonic plates of our civilization are now shifting right underneath our collective feet. And not only that, but the acceleration of these change is now coming in such a way that most of you really have no way of knowing what tomorrow, tomorrow's headlines will bring. The news cycle used to be what? A week, then 48 hours, then 24 hours, then 12 hours. Now it's every hour. And we're losing even the ability to be surprised or shocked as the next pillar of our civilization crumbles. One boundary after another is transgressed. One institution after another is torn down. One pillar after another demolished. And sadly, we're watching this, the dismantling of an entire civilization by people who claim that in doing so, they're serving the liberation of humanity. We are watching day by day, moment by moment, the realization of the great technocratic, oligarchical, intersectional, postmodern Fabian socialist dream. And what was that dream? It was the dream of a humanity come of age, of a humanity that could sever itself from its Judeo-Christian, 
capitalistic, equal opportunity-based, enlightenment-inspired, modernist, and reasoned past and establish itself in a new postmodern present and point itself to a new technocratic open society future. The move, simply put, is to transform our society from an analog civilization to a digital civilization. From what you know to be true, physical, certain, objective, into the unreal, subjective, and downright mythological. The great postmodern neo-Marxist dream was that you could have the fruits of the Judeo-Christian ethic in a civilization while denying reason, logic, the scientific method, mathematics, subverting exegetical methodologies at virtually every point. The fact and reality of the matter is that thus far, the great postmodern neo-Marxist dream has not produced human flourishing at all. It has, it has not produced human happiness. Now, there are all sorts of income redistribution schemes that can point to on the surface that they have some impact on improving our world, of distributing monetary methods to other peoples. But all the while, ignoring and denying the millions of murders under their own Marxist agenda. But the bottom line is that human dignity has not increased globally. The sanctity of human life and human flourishing, the pursuit of verified knowledge and truth has not been more affirmed, but less affirmed. And we're watching not only the sanctity of human life being denied at the beginning of life, but through every stage of the human life spectrum. Now, after so much progress over the last 50 years, human beings are accusing other human beings of collective guilt based upon their skin color or their own heritage. Entire professions of people who have sworn to uphold the law are being told that they are all bastards. Yes, you preachers of equity, resentment and vengeance, you are the ones that have become the monsters. You are transforming an entire civilization into subservient orcs. I know that this isn't the end game, though. This is simply being set up to make you, the woke leaders of our day, the saviors again, to promote a third way. A third way that is a cult. It is a cult of transformation. The intrinsic value and dignity of every single human life has been discarded, discarded for the sake of intersectional collectivity and purpose civilizational change. It is common today that if one was to say, I am a patriot, or that, heaven forbid, that you support law enforcement, that you would be condemned as an alt-right, bigoted, nationalistic Nazi. If you stand for your nation's constitutional heritage, you will be criticized as being akin to Mussolini. Why has the entire foundation of law and justice been cast aside in an all-out embrace of neo-Marxist source social justice conformity? You need to ask yourself this. Why have the Judeo-Christian concepts of freedom and liberty been thrown into the ash heap of history as the nations of the earth sprint towards the chains of global manipulation? And now, today, and... The last time that we had a major conference was in London. And myself and Dr. Lindsay was, was there, Peter Boghossian was there. I actually was the only Christian at the conference. But we were surrounded and locked down by Extinction Rebellion in London. They literally controlled all the streets. You couldn't get there via taxi, you couldn't get there via subway. We live in a strange time. But here we are in 2020, 
Here's what you've got to ask yourself. Will the United States succumb to the corporate oligarchs, the neo-Maoist cultural revolutionaries, and the manipulation of neophyte ecclesial deconstructionists? What is happening to us? What is happening is that humanity is being transitioned. Transitioned exponentially. Transformed individually in civilization against our will. Transition from what we were to what the technocrats, you know, the experts, have in store for us for our own good, for our safety. So how did we get here? And more importantly, the big question you need to ask right now is, where are we going? I guess we would first answer the question of why would anyone insist on taking the entirety of the world down this path? Well, intellectuals are naturally attracted by the idea of a planned society in the belief that they will be in charge of it someday. There is a massive societal shift away from the established modes of religion and political ideology and towards a society which various forms of victimhood can provide markers of social status. And there is a reason for this. It is a means to an end. The trigger at the very heart of the desire to create massive change in society or in a large organization is reflexivity. The very first thing that I ever spoke about in sovereign nations, before sovereign nations actually even launched, was the subject of reflexivity. Because I was very aware, very much aware of it and very much involved in it. So let me, let me just explain this weaponized theory in as simple of terms as I can. And maybe it will help as we dig into the weeds. How many of you are familiar with the Greek legend of Pygmalion? Anybody? Well, good. One man up front. Well, Pygmalion, if you'll remember, was the Cypriot sculptor who carved a woman on his own out of ivory, according to mythology, after seeing the other women prostituting themselves and having a great distaste for that. Pygmalion declared, as a matter of fact, he said he was not interested in women. But then he found his personally carved statue was so beautiful and realistic that he actually fell in love with it. In time, Aphrodite's festival day came, and Pygmalion made offerings at the altar of Aphrodite. There, too scared to admit his desire, he quietly wished for a bride who would be the living likeness of my ivory girl. When he returned home with his carved statue, he kissed his ivory statue and found that its lips felt warm. He kissed it again, and he found that the ivory had lost its hardness. Aphrodite had granted Pygmalion's wish in the legend. Pygmalion married the ivory sculpture that he himself carved, which changed to a woman under Aphrodite's blessing. So this idea that being disgruntled with the current state of the world and desiring to make the world what you had wished it to be by your own desire, by your own magical thoughts, by your own efforts to make what is not true, what is even scientifically not true, true. Ladies and gentlemen, this is reflexivity. How about this one? How many of you in the room remember the musical My Fair Lady? Good, so many of you. Do you remember what the original title of both the book and the play was of My Fair Lady by George Bernard Shaw? Pygmalion. So you do know the story. So Henry Higgins wandering through Covent Garden to stumble upon Eliza Doolittle. Eliza do little. She doesn't do much anything at all. She's of low caste, a rough cockney flower girl. She could never be passed off as a sophisticated nobility, right? That was the whole idea of this. And Henry Higgins magically transforms Eliza Doolittle into a beautiful, sophisticated, civilized woman to fool the world. 
He took what wasn't and made it what he wanted it to be, even though it still really wasn't. It was a lie. Reflexivity. Now let's get as specific as we can. Those that push the concept of reflexivity argue that empirical truth, observable, testable, objectively provable truth, cannot be known with absolute certainty. They will claim even scientific laws can't be verified beyond a shadow of a doubt. They can only be falsified by testing. They will state that scientific laws are hypothetical in character and their truth remains subject to testing. They will say that ideologies which can, that claim to be in possession of the ultimate truth are making false claims. Therefore, they can impose on society those imperfect truths only by force. This applies to capitalism, fascism, national claims of sovereignty, or religions that make absolute truth claims. In their view, all these oppressive ideologies lead to repression of achieving operational goals. And they lead to oppression of people that are outside of your truth. Those that are in different tribes, if you will, from Popper's standpoint. To really understand this, it is good that we take a moment just to understand the principle of alchemy. Alchemy is the scientific method seeks to understand things as they are. So in other words, the scientific method, those steps that you go through, falsification processes, how to arrive at objective truth, they understand things as they actually are, the correspondence theory of truth. While alchemy seeks to bring about a desired state of affairs. To put it another way, the primary objective of science is truth. That of alchemy, operational success. Take a moment and think about that for a moment. Think about how many things that are happening around you right now in the world, not just right now, but over the last, let's say, eight to ten years, where things that you know that are you're being told not to believe those things, to cast doubt upon them. Not only things such as biological truths, but even just straight up math. In other words, the scientific method for those in the fields of research and science is to find objective truth, to know things for what they really are. In other words, what corresponds to reality? We call that the correspondence theory of truth. For those of you that are pastors and theologians in attendance, you have given yourself to the same mode of research called hermeneutics and exegesis, to really know what the Bible says and what it teaches. You want to know the truth. But now, our woke contemporaries, they are concerned about the truth. They are attempting to bring about their desired state of affairs, how they want things to be. Those of you, I believe, that are in this room, your goal is truth. The goal of those that are our adversaries, the woke, the subjectivists, the trans-Christians, and I say that because they're transforming Christianity into something else, else, their goal is operational success. And that driving towards operational success is what drives the woke movement. It's what drives this movement in mathematics, in research, in public health, in medicine, in legal practice, in law enforcement, in science, in evangelical Christianity in Roman Catholicism, in Islam, in Zen Buddhism. I heard recently that our Trojan Horse series of videos that I did with Dr. Lindsay and Dr. Bogosian was being shown over a three-week period at one of the largest Jewish temples in Tennessee. That's how far this reaches. This is all for their operational success. And the reason why this is so wide, and the reason why it's the same play everywhere that it is, is because their plan 
is to create a great reset of everything. And just what and who is their opponent, our adversaries? It's not necessarily you. You're just kind of getting in the way. Their opponent is the truth. And why is truth the enemy? Because the truth will set you free. And this horrible lie, this Pygmalion process is relying upon reflexivity to put alchemy into motion. The concept of reflexivity needs little more explanation, though. It applies exclusively to situations that have thinking participants. That's us. The participant's thinking serves two functions. One is to understand the world that we live in, right? This is called the cognitive function. The other is to change the situation to your advantage. This is called the manipulative function. The two functions connect thinking and reality in opposite directions, and hence the reliance on alchemy. In the real world, in cognitive function, reality is supposed to determine the participant's views. I mean, this is what we all want, though, right? The direction of causation is from the world, as we see it, to the mind, to process it, to test and see whether that is true. And that is what we accept, both in the natural world, and for those of you that are Christians here, this is how you understand Scripture. You let Scripture dictate to you what you understand. This is the basis, basis, basically, of the scientific method. It's the basis of hermeneutics. Now, in contrast to this, let's make a clear line of differentiation. By con contrast, in the manipulative function, the opposite function, the alchemy function, the reflexive mode, the mode of alchemy, the direction of causation is from the mind to the world. That is to say, the intentions of the participants have an effect on the world. And it is this creative cause that begins in the mind instead of cause that begins in reality. Manipulation takes place. The pursuit of your own purposed goals. The pursuit of your own control. The destruction of actual truth. You will be told to think things, to say things, to believe things that just aren't so. This is the same thing that Alexander Solzhenitsyn said was happening in the Soviet Union. We all just got tired of lying. Now, in the real world, if the cognitive function operated in isolation without any interference from the manipulative function, it could produce knowledge. And why is this? Because objectively true knowledge is represented by true statements. A statement is true if it corresponds to the facts. That is what the correspondence theory of truth tells us. But if there is interference from the manipulative function coming from the mind of the world, coming from the mind to whatever the object of truth is, to whatever the object of the standard is. The facts no longer serve as an independent criterion by which the truth of a statement can be judged because the correspondence may have been brought about by the statement changing the facts. And thus, the great controversy that surrounded Dr. Lindsay over the past several months is that James Lindsay refused to say that two plus two equals five. And the gall that this man had, that his opinion that was obviously coming through his oppressive mindset, by his privileged mindset, of Western mathematics, that he insisted that two plus two equals four. 
How horrible of him. I'm serious. I'm, maybe some of you are not aware of this. But this made it actually, was it in USA Today, I believe? And other periodicals? This was a massive fight over the last three months. So when you think about your own battle, wherever you are right now, whatever you, maybe the battle's in faith, maybe it's at your work, maybe it's another, in some other affinity group, that's what it boils down to, folks. Does two plus two equal four? And if that's up for a fight, what do you think is coming around the corner? There is no place for ideological safety right now. And that's where reflexivity kicks in. If you have enough people insisting that two plus two equals five, and chastise those that rail against the false concept of this nonsense, you can generate a negative or positive feedback loop. Feedback loops can be either negative or positive. Negative feedback brings the participants' views and the actual situation closer together. Positive feedback drives them further apart. In other words, a negative feedback process is self-correcting. It can go on forever, and if there are no significant changes in external reality, it may eventually lead to an equilibrium. This is what Hayek spoke about in his understanding of economics, where the participants' views come to correspond with the actual state of affairs. By contrast, though, a positive feedback process is self-reinforcing. It cannot go on forever because eventually the participants' views would become so far removed from objective reality that the participants would have to recognize them as unrealistic. Nor can the process occur without any change in the actual state of affairs. Because it is in the nature of positive feedback that it reinforces whatever tendency prevails in the real world. This is what we call a fertile fallacy. Fertile fallacies, interpretations of reality that are distorted, distorted. Yet they produce results even though they are lies. I mean, think of it this way. You can think of it as some truth, but it is wrapped all in a lie. To where in the, at first look and first glance you go, yeah, there's a problem there. there. There's really something there. But yet all the package that it's wrapped in is a complete farcical lie. It reinforces the reflexive momentum that you are attempting to bring to operational success. So let's just take a moment to pause. Let's think about the reflexive movements that are not based upon reality, but that are meant to produce operational success. And if reflexivity is dependent upon continuous feedback loops. If you want to create a reflexive movement, something that changes all of society, something that changes what was understood by everyone as this is the way that things are, this is our standard. If you want to change that, you literally need to have everyone in the big lie. Everyone, everywhere. So if you can have every social media organization, if you can have every mass media organization, if you can have every source of research, if you can have every educational institution, if you can have nearly every religious institution, if you can have every major corporation, if you can have nearly all of your politicians, if you can have push notifications to every phone to continue with a reflexive wheel to make sure that it's creating a reflexive fog that's everywhere, if you can have commercials running constantly on the television, if you can have every major league sport communicate your fertile fallacy for the purposes of reflexivity, well, now ladies and gentlemen, maybe you're starting to begin reflexivity. When speaking about reflexivity in scientific research, Dr. Joan Eakin from the University of Toronto and the Dalla Lana School of Public Health says this about reflexivity in research. What is called reflexivity in qualitative research, self-knowledge, 
is the capacity to recognize and to utilize for analytic purposes your own location, your own experience, and relation to what analytical purposes are being studied. In other words, you use yourself as a data sample. So what is your standpoint? What cognitive biases maybe do you have? Well, as a research, you can add that into your qualitative research. Come up with your own truth. Make the world the way that you want it to be. Take the world that we know now, that we understood as working together, together synchronistically. Shatter it to bits. But put it together in the way that you want to see it. This is self-knowledge. Self-creation of the operational success that you wish to conceive. For those that are experiencing these massive changes across our society. I know it's hard to understand how we get to the point where things are right now. How we end up in some of the terrible places that we're in. Where nothing could be thought of is, well, when this date comes and we vote, either you win or you lose. That's how we've done things in this country for over 200 years. We've never been in a time where, in California this past week, in regards to how much of the population was no longer affected by coronavirus, but in California, exact, I forget exactly what municipality was in, they said, no, we're not gonna open up yet because yes, while the white population seems to be pretty much clear of coronavirus, the Hispanic and, and uh, African-American populations are not. So we're gonna keep everybody locked down. It's called health equity. You know how we end up in terrible places? Like where we are right, right now? One tiny step at a time. If I encroach on you and I'm sophisticated about it, I'm going to encroach two millimeters. I'm going to encroach right to the point where you stop me and start to protest. And then I'm going to stop. And you're going to say, okay, well, everything's all right now. We have peace. It's okay. Then I'm going to wait until you calm down and forget about it. Then I'm going to encroach again. Right to the point where you protest. And then I'm going to stop again. And then I'm going to wait. And I'm just going to do that forever. And before you know it, you're going to be three miles down from where you had started. And you'll have done it one tiny step at a time. And then you'll say, how did I get here? And the answer was, well, I pushed you a little farther than you should have gone. And you agreed. So then I pushed you a little further than you should have gone. And again, you agreed. You did nothing. It's time to stop agreeing. It's time to end this reflexive madness. I think all of us that are here in this room understand that something is coming to a head to a point. If you're someone that's denying that anything has changed in this past year, either you're lying or you're mentally unstable. I think we can all say that with certainty right now. But this has been coming one tiny step at a time. If you think back six, seven, eight, nine, ten years ago, you all heard whispers of the things that are now taking place all over our nation. You heard them, but you said, ah, oh, but so-and-so couldn't have said that. That institution wouldn't do that. I know those guys. Those are good guys. You know, he really didn't. He couldn't have meant what you think he means when he said that. 
And then they turn up the heat again. And then maybe they form a coalition. Maybe a number of them get together and they continue to say these things together. And maybe they'll put out five articles that are really good, but for every five, there's one that's like, wow, what's this about equity and inclusion? And all of a sudden, what is this about critical race theory and intersectionality? And where's all this coming from? Well, understand, critical race theory is simply a tool. I think we've been over this many times. It's a tool of destruction. And intersectionality, after you have the destruction, after you have the implosion created by critical race theory, where everything is burnt to the ground, intersectionality is what comes along and takes all that rubble and builds it back again upside down. They build back better in their terms but they build back in a way that could only be held together with current modern engineering, with the kind of technology that you have today that can hold impossible structures up. If you've ever seen postmodern architecture, you would know what I'm saying. Bizarre shapes that there's no way that that can be held up. The base is this small and the top is that big because it's not natural, but it can be done. So if it can be done, we should do it. So all of a sudden you see that many folks that you would say have been saying these things about critical theory, about critical race theory, that have been opposing critical theory and critical race theory, all these folks now are starting to jump on the bandwagon to say, yes, critical race theory is a problem and critical theory is an issue. Great. What do you have to say about intersectionality? Silence. Again, can you talk to me about intersectionality? Well, I see some value in intersectionality. You know, because it follows an Augustinian framework. And intersectionality is a great way for us to understand still, oh, okay, I see where you're going now. In other words, critical race theory and critical theory is a means to an end. The end, the future, To quote Ariana Grande, (laughs) to quote several other pop stars, to quote several movie actors, to quote Kimberly Crenshaw, the future is intersectional. And intersectionality is the perfect grid framework for everything. It's what promotes equity. It's what promotes diversity. It's what promotes inclusion. But in fact, What it promotes is discrimination. It is systemic oppression. And just like it's always been, the thing that they they accuse you of is what they're actually doing to you. That's what intersectionality is. It is verified, checked, laws passed, legislated, Discrimination. Not based on merit, on whether you earned it. Not based on opportunity, on whether you worked hard for it, whether you studied for it, whether you risked all for it. No. It's based upon your skin color, upon your ethnicity, upon what you believe, upon your ideas. And it isn't it amazing that one of the ways that we start to get this to this area first with intersectionality is through public health. Let's remember something. Way back in the late 1700s, there was another revolution, not ours here, but in France. And Robespierre and the Jacobins, after they took King Louis and killed him and ended the national constitution, And in that process, before the Jacobins really got going into their reign of terror, what did they impose for everybody, since there was really no constitution? The Committee on Public Safety. Now it's about your safety. It's not about your rights. 
It's not about what's guaranteed to you from the state and the agreement that we have as a citizen and a nation. Our contract is the Constitution. Oh, that's old stuff now. You go to see the Constitution, the Declaration of Independence in Washington, D.C. right now, you have to walk through the center first before you get up to the top room. You can no longer go up the steps and be right there. And what you're going to go through in that, that center below is you'll find out, you know, if you're an American Indian, that Declaration and Constitution is not for you. If you're an African American, that Declaration and Constitution is not for you. If you're a woman, that Declaration and Constitution is not for you. If you're a Latino, that Declaration and Constitution is not for you. If you are Asian, that Declaration and Constitution is not for you. It was only for white males. That's who it's for. It doesn't include you. That's in the National Archives, folks. And how that hasn't been ripped out in this past administration, I've written them several times. That was planting the seed of deconstruction. We have a long way to go. It's going to take all of us. And hopefully by this fallible speech that I've given. Hopefully you'll understand that we gotta work together. If you wanna save the church, you're gonna have to stand a lot stronger and become a lot louder. You know, we stand on shoulders of giants. I lead tours through Germany, through Switzerland, through England, through Scotland where men said, here I stand, I can do no other. And I can take you to the places where those men burned. So here I stand. And I say to you, play the man. Play the man, and not just for the next month. Do it consistently now. As if your life, your wife, your family, your home, your nation, and as if the gospel depends upon it. Put aside petty squabbles. Put aside the ascendancy of your ministry and how far you want to go. Because how far you might want to go might just bring you quicker to the guillotine. Now's the time to stand together. Now's the time to work together. We must beat this, and we must beat it today. Thank you. <laughs>